folks. Welcome back to the Podcast Digest. My name is Dan Lizette. This is episode 105. Thank you very much for joining me once again to take you behind the scenes of one of your favorite or soon-to-be favorite shows. And I've got a very special guest this week, uh, another one that came from my attendance at Podcast Movement in Chicago this year. My guest this week is a New York Times bestselling author. She's been on the Oprah Winfrey Show. She created and hosts one of the most well-known podcasts and podcast networks of all time. Uh, she's also a recent inductee into the Academy of Podcasters Hall of Fame, where I had the pleasure of meeting her in person this summer. My guest this week, the one and only Mignon Fogarty. Mignon, welcome to the Podcast Digest. Dan, thanks for that great introduction. That was wonderful. <laughs> oh Well, I, I could have gone a lot longer uh, in looking through all of your wonderful accomplishments, and we're going to talk about a lot of them. So I tried to condense it into a, a highlight show, if you will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I, I tried to capture a few, but it barely scratches the surface. But <laughs> most people, I imagine, have heard of Grammar Girl, and if not, I have no idea where these people are, which rock they're residing under. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. But before we do... Uh, I was hoping to ask you a little bit about life before podcasting, way before you jumped in front of a microphone. Can you tell folks a little bit about sort of uh, the things you were uh, involved with back then and maybe your schooling or where you're from, those type of things? Sure. Long, long ago in a land far away. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, so uh, before I started podcasting, I – well, let's go back. I, I do – I have an undergraduate degree in English from the University of Washington. I grew up in rainy Seattle, which I still love and try to visit in the summer when it's sunny. <laughs> and um, – but then I took this huge detour, and I ended up in a PhD program at Stanford, working on a PhD in biology, working on fruit fly genetics um, in the late 90s. And at some point, realized that that what really wasn't for me, and um, I dropped out to join um, my friend's startup. That was during the crazy dot com days in the Sil in Silicon Valley. So um, I joined my friend's startup, and then I joined a series of other startups, working as um, an editor and executive producer. You know, st mainly still in the writing and content production area. And then um, when the last one went out of business <laughs> in 2000, um, I started my career as a freelance writer and editor. And actually, it, it wasn't. So so bad because um, I worked at a health and technology startup, and all the people who lost their jobs scattered and went to different biotech companies, and they all ended up hiring me to do their um, marketing, writing. I, I wrote um, white papers, and I ghost wrote scientific articles, and I wrote marketing materials for like, DNA synthesizers. So even though it was scary to have all these companies going out of business, I actually had freelance work very quickly. So that was a big relief. Um, and then, you know, I just, I just love technology. And I heard about this thing called podcasting. And it sounded so intriguing. Like, to me, podcasting was to radio, like what blogging was to newspapers. It was a way to go directly to the audience. And I, I was just so intrigued. And so I started podcasting. A lot of people don't know I had a science podcast um, before I started the Grammar Girl podcast. And I, I did that for about eight months first. And then um, I was actually looking for something easier to do with the science podcast. I was interviewing experts and interviews were really hard to do back then in audio and scheduling other people was hard. I had a co-host and um, it was just really time consuming. And so when I started Grammar Girl, I was looking for something easier to do. And I thought, well, a five minute quick tip about writing, it's kind of what I'm doing for my clients right now. And if it's just me and it's a scripted show, it'll be a lot faster. So that was what led me to Grammar Girl. So if I'm if, just by asking you one question, I'm getting the impression already, Mignon, that you're, you're, you're pretty much fearless at this point. The reason I say that is it, it, you were in school at Washington for English, right? Stanford right. with master's was biology. Yeah. And you walked away with that to go to a startup. And right. Then in, in the, the mid 2000s, this 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 nascent technology of podcasting, it was so small back then. You <laughs> jumped in there as well. So is that kind of do you jump out of planes or are you just one of these like <laughs> fearless people in every aspect? 
Well, you know, it's so funny because sometimes my family refers to me as safety girl <laughs> because <laughs> when my first job out of college, I worked at an insurance brokerage and I saw all the horrible things that can happen to people. So <laughs> it, it made me kind of wary about the world. But it's true. Like, I'm not afraid to try new things, especially in business. And, and I do like I did absorb that Silicon Valley idea of not being afraid to fail, failing fast. If you see an opportunity, take it. So, so I guess it's true. And I'm, you know, I mean, I went from having taken no science in college to getting into a Stanford PhD program in biology. So, you know, I'm obviously I'm not afraid to go for it yeah. <laughs> and try, try hard things. You know, I, I love to sure. try hard things. So, so towards uh, r- right before you started up Grammar Girl, you you you, like you said you had the science podcast and you wanted something a, a little more uh, simpler, at least uh, simpler, I imagine, in, in the sense of more or less you're relying on, especially in those early days, just on yourself, right? You're putting together the episodes. Um, but prior to that, did you have you were did a lot of writing? Were you did it? Was it something that was always drawn to you, like the formalities of the writing or the language uses? Was this always something that? attracted you even in your schooling days or or post-school as as an important topic? Yeah, I did always love writing. I was the editor-in-chief of my school paper, and I worked at the local newspaper one summer, and I kept at it in college. I mean, it rains a lot in Seattle, so my mom would take me to the library, uh, you know, when I was out of school to take like I take little poetry classes at the library and stuff just to keep me busy because you had to do indoor things. <laughs> and I read a lot. You know, I just, it was just harder to play outside. <laughs> so, yeah. You need to find the still, indoor thing to do, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons Seattle's a big reading city, a big literary city. So, so yeah, I developed a love of language and reading and writing really early and, and, and did stick with it. And obviously at that time when you decided that uh, around grammar slash writing was, was uh, you know, a, a podcast to start, why not a co-host? Uh, starting on your own is uh, a little daunting, but uh, was that sort of the plan from the beginning or was there any early thoughts on a co-host or, or was this kind of the format people can hear today? Was that sort of uh, from Jump Street? Well, I did have a co-host for my science podcast. Um, Adam Lowe was someone I worked with at that last startup that went under him, and I convinced him to do the podcast with me. Um, I handled most of the technology side of it, the actual show production. Um, But yeah, and and, I mean, it was great. I loved working with Adam. And he actually, when I started um, the Quick and Dirty Tips Network, he became the original Modern Manners guy, which was the first show in the network after Grammar Girl. So, you know, we loved working together. But it, it, just having a co-host and scheduling us both at the same time was, you know, one level of complexity, you know, on top of many more in producing that science show. So with Grammar Girl, you decided to give it a go alone. Right. Just ex- exactly to keep the production simpler. And so when you started this, what was in your mind? Like, were you thinking this will be something good to do for a little bit or I'll do this and see what happens? Sort of at that point, what did you foresee coming of Grammar Girl? So here's the thing. When I started, I I was thinking of it as a hobby um, because – the science podcast had been, you know, it had won like an early podcasting award, but it, and I tried really hard to promote it, and it never really got enough traction that I felt like it could be a job. But um, so when I started Grammar Girl, it was really just sort of as a hobby to keep my toes in podcasting. But the other thing my family says about me is that I don't have hobbies, that everything I do, <laughs> I instantly think, oh, this could be a business. <laughs> and that's why I'm also, I'm also the chair of media entrepreneurship at the University of Nevada, because that's just how my brain works. Like literally last week I was doing um, aerobic. I started doing aerobics and I'm like, you know, people get paid to do this. Like why, <laughs> why am I just here doing this by myself? I should start an aerobic studio. <laughs> well, because, so, you know, in all your free time, right? Right, in all my free time, right. But if I'm going to work out, like I should turn it into a business. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> there's got to be a – maybe you can maybe you could uh, combine them. I wonder if there's an aerobic podcast. I know Elsie Escobar with Lipson does the yoga uh, there's several yoga podcasts. There's got to be some type of aerobic type uh, podcast. Right. And I know it's crazy, but that's just how my mind works. You know, if I grow tomatoes, I'm like, oh, I could sell these on the side of the road. <laughs> I'm, th- I'm thinking I'm thinking of sister network, Mignon, quick and dirty workouts. <laughs> <laughs> you sure. Know, yoga. Yeah, I can partner yeah. with the get fit guy. <laughs> there you go. See, <laughs> we're, we're going to get to the, the, the whole collection of shows here in just a minute. But I'm, I'm curious, as you launched this early show, sort of what was the feedback? Did Because at that time, I think this is safe to say, 
on that topic at that time, there really was, you were sort of the, the first game in town, correct, in the podcasting space? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things I loved about the science podcast, I had worked as a science writer. And with the podcast, I heard from listeners every week. And when you're writing for magazines, you never hear from readers. Maybe once every six months, you'll get one letter. So, you know, and suddenly I was hearing from my audience and it was amazing. And that was one thing I really loved about podcasting. And when I started Grammar Girl, it it just took off like nothing I ever expected. It was number two at iTunes within six weeks. And I was just being flooded with messages from listeners who said, I just discovered your show and I love it. And I told all my friends or I made everyone in my office listen. Um, The feedback was fast and big and amazing. Do you you think it was just the podcasting space needed this? Or what what was your sort of self-diagnosis on how this got so successful so quick? Yeah, it was hard because, I mean, my science podcast had been featured at iTunes and, you know, didn't, nothing really happened. And the grammar podcast was featured and it exploded. Um, I think there was just, at the time, there was just nothing like it. And it really appealed to the people who found it. And then they were massively enthusiastic. And it really spread by word of mouth. There, as far, you know, because I, after the fact, I kind of went back and looked and I couldn't find, and there were no articles or anything like that that I could find that caused it to grow so fast. It just, I, there was just obviously a real need and enthusiasm for that kind of show at that time. So for Grammar Girl itself, that show, when we're talking about sort of the expansion and the blow up, I'm just speculating here. But did you start to hear in some of these feedbacks you were receiving that it was starting to be used in classrooms or by college students or professors? Was this becoming like almost educational material to some folks? Not right away, because it takes a while. That's one thing. I published a book for students and was surprised it takes years for it to be adopted in schools. It's just a slow uptake because of the planning and the bureaucracy. So in the beginning, it really did seem to be offices, um, Uh offices and grammar enthusiasts. And one thing that I think was more different back then than is now, all of the language, almost all of the language commentary back then was really snarky and um, superior. You know, I can't believe all these stupid people make these horrible mistakes. And my goal was to be fun and friendly and to help people who wanted to learn. If if you want to learn English, if you want to improve your writing, I'm here to help. I'm not here to criticize you and make you feel stupid. So I, I think that that positive, fun approach really appealed to people as well, that that they were tired of being told they were stupid because they didn't know how to use a comma and here was someone to help them and also someone that they could recommend to someone they thought needed help without insulting them. That's yeah. The approachability has got to be uh, one of the huge reasons for the success uh, along with so many others uh, that that, that I want to touch on as well. But uh, as you're moving on in these early days, you mentioned within six weeks, it was uh, had reached number two overall in iTunes. Was it at that point or somewhere around that point when uh, this entrepreneurial mind of yours started to uh, think about uh, quick and dirty? Yeah, definitely. Because of my time, especially because of my time in Silicon Valley, I knew that something that caught on that fast had the potential to be more, to be a whole business and a whole network. And, you know, I really felt like, especially at the time, um, most podcasts were, you know, people talking among themselves and tended to be really long. And um, I thought that the quick and dirty tip format you know, five, seven minutes scripted, doesn't waste your time, teaches you one thing in, in a show. I thought that was also a, a really important part of the success. And that's something that's really easy to um, replicate across different topics. So like I said, uh, Modern Manners guy, Adam Lowe, back then was the, the first show in the Quick and Dirty Tips network. And um, as I just started, really just started calling my friends who I thought might be good <laughs> podcast hosts. You know, the, the Mighty Mommy was a friend I knew from Arizona who was a great mom. And Money Girl was my neighbor who was really good with money. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was people I knew. And so I, I grew, I got five or six people to, together to be the core of the Quick and Dirty Tips network. 
And that was off and running. And I do have several more questions about that. But I, kind of following the chronology about this time, were you one of, you had to have been one of the first networks out there, right? Besides, you know, the big, big ones, the big, you know, kind of TV network spinoffs or what have you. And there may not have been that many of those back then. But did you feel as if you were one of the earliest sort of collective slash networks out there? Well, you know, it's funny. There were other networks, and I reached out to them at first to see if I could join. Actually, I was looking for a network to join, and, you know, people either didn't respond, or they did, and they weren't interested, and, or they did, and then I didn't think that what they had to offer was all that great. So, finally, after, I don't know, maybe six weeks of trying to get some help, seeing, you know, I, I was like, fine, I'll do it myself. <laughs> At, at this time, in these early days, were you still holding down a quote-unquote day job at that point as well? I was, yes. That was crazy. So I was working as uh, essentially making my living freelancing full-time. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a crazy time. Those first six months in particular, I was doing both. <laughs> So what what was one of the most ridiculous things you can remember from that time? Were you recording Grammar Girl at 3.30 in the morning or, or some ridiculous story like that? What, what's the craziest thing you remember from back then? There was no one crazy thing, but, you know, for the first I, for the first three years, I didn't take a vacation and I did not take a weekend, a full weekend off. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was. It, and yeah, it just it, it was just what had to be done to keep it all all the balls in the air. But, and I'm glad I did it, but I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Silicon Valley startup mentality right there. That's for yeah. sure. Throw it all in there to, uh, <laughs> to make it happen. Um, earlier in, in the time as well, early on in these days here, and I have to mention, I mentioned it in the intro because I've got to know, how in the world did it feel to make an appearance on Oprah? I was terrified. <laughs> oh, like for was... how long? I can, were you like sleepless for nights? I, I couldn't imagine. Well, you don't have that much notice. So I had about five days notice and I was so busy getting ready to go for the first, you know, maybe four days that, you know, I mean, it was crazy and I was excited, but, you know, I wasn't freaking out. And then the night before I s woke up, sat up in bed screaming. Oh, <laughs> I was geez. so scared. I was just free. So, so terrified. And, um, you know, it was great. I mean, it was a wonderful experience. And I actually, I'm still kind of, you know, I, the producer who no longer works there and I, we follow each other on Facebook. And, you know, it was just an amazing experience. But it was also probably one of the most stressful things I've ever done. <laughs> was, it, was it just terrifying during the recording when she's there? Were you just shaking uncontrollably? Cause I, I was. <laughs> I had no idea my mouth could be that dry. <laughs> I, I, it just amazing and you don't meet her beforehand so you know because she, she says she wants to keep it authentic and so you know you, you don't meet her till you walk out on live you know essentially live tv uh, it, it's just incredibly surreal and and yeah and um i i actually slipped and fell backstage oh, like 30 seconds before I was supposed to go on because I had on new shoes and they were really slippery. <laughs> right. And and so, you know, I'm backstage surrounded by security who's trying to make sure I'm okay. Like, like literally maybe a minute to 30 seconds before I go on and meet her and have to do my segment. So <laughs> it was crazy. You know, you're not supposed to literally interpret break a leg here, Mignon. I mean... <laughs> You were trying your best, that's for sure. But. Yeah, and um, the Chris Brown was the musical guest on the show, so he oh, and his whole wow. entourage were backstage, and it was all it was just this crazy, fun, wild that's, <laughs> experience. That's booking at its finest. You have Grammar Girl and Chris Brown. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's booking at its finest, right there. That is wonderful. <laughs> well, I I can imagine that's also one of those experiences where, kind of like after that. Everything else you do at this point, while they may be kind of big deals or nerve wracking or important, it's like, well, I made it through Oprah, right? I can make it through this. <laughs> right, <laughs> I survived. Right. Yeah. That's what, I, that's what I tell my wife all the time. I'm like, look, we can face anything, honey. We, we made it through the wedding. Okay. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> after that, everything's you know gravy from here on out. So. Yeah. <laughs> so at that point was, at, and I wanted to ask you that just because obviously it's something you ask about, but also because that had to be another huge kind of, you know, hockey stick moment in the growth of Grammar Girl and Quick and Dirty Tips. Did you notice that after that it was just kind of full on 
we're all into this forever. You know, it was really interesting because it, I mean, it was big, but it wasn't as big as you might imagine. Mm. So it didn't do much for the podcast because they, um, they um, barely mentioned the podcast on the, um, on the show. Like they mentioned it, but it wasn't a big deal. And mm. then, so, but we did see a huge spike in traffic to the website, um, you know, but it didn't, you know, it didn't translate into 50% more visitors forever. You know, it was mostly a spike and then maybe, you know, 5, five 10%. Do you grow. write that off to maybe the audience and podcasts mainstream level of acceptance at that point? Yeah, I think a lot of people back then still didn't know what a podcast was and it was something that would have been hard to get. Whereas a website is much easier to understand. Right. Um, what was really cool. I didn't even realize how cool this was at the time, but I really wished that I had a book out, but I didn't have a book out when I was invited to go into Oprah. But <clears throat> what we did is my publisher and I, Macmillan and I, we rushed out a one hour audio book based on my podcasts and got that for sale within a week, which is unheard wow. of in the publishing world that yeah. the New York times actually wrote an article about that afterward. <laughs> wow. Um, and so, and we did see, you know, pretty nice sales of that audio book, which we promoted on the website. So, you know, that, that was, that was probably the biggest thing that happened from being on there. And it wasn't like New York times bestseller numbers or anything, but it was like, you know, a decent amount of sales. So that was, that, you know, so on, on the plane on the way home, I was still writing the script for the book. <laughs> but, wow. yeah. Well, I, I see your segue and I will accept your segue. Let's talk about the book. And uh, I mentioned it in the intro, New York Times bestselling author. Was this sort of something you always had in your mind as well uh, from the beginning of Grammar Girl? Or was this sort of a, a return to kind of the, the more natural form of writing? Obviously, you write scripts for every episode. But was this sort of something you always wanted to to kind of get out there and seemed a natural extension of the show? Yeah, definitely. Um, when I we'll, we'll get to this, I'm in, I'm sure. But when I pitched the partnership to McMillan, um, you know, I outlined all the different things that could be add ons to the podcast, and you know, books were the the most obvious one because it's you know it's a reference book. People write grammar books, so it was a really obvious thing, and. Um, <clears throat> You know, I really credit the podcast audience with making it a New York Times bestseller. It was definitely the enthusiasm of that audience that that led to the the big push in sales. The um, the the way the bestseller lists work is that it, it's the number of sales in one week um, that get you on the list, and and then pre orders. If people order the book before it becomes first available for sale, that all goes into the first week, and and I'm just feel sure that it was my podcast audience, you know, enthusiastically buying the book that first week that got it under the list. And this was, let me see if I got this straight. This was Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing, correct? Right. Yes. Yes. I see it still on Amazon. If folks, I'm going to put a link in the show notes for this. And uh, 272 reviews. Very well loved. So, yeah. It's, 4. it's 4. so 7 nice. out of 5. Look at that. <laughs> it's it's so wonderful to see that people still like it. <laughs> well, like you said, it's reference material. I imagine just about every word of that still applies today. Is is that true? Have you looked at that? I have. Actually, we're talking about doing a 10-year anniversary update. Oh. And, you know, actually next week probably I'm going to start going through the book again and seeing what could be updated. And there's I, there's a section in the back about the last chapter, I think, about social media. And so I'm sure I'll update that. And then I'll probably add some things to it that have you know, occurred to me that are important to know over the years. But, but yeah, no, it's been, it's wonderful to see how, you know, the book still getting positive reviews. That always makes my day when I see that. And if I'm, I'm, was, there are a ton of subsequent books, correct? Right. I wrote, uh, seven books in six years. <laughs> wow. Yeah, free time, right? All your free yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> that was part of that first three years where I didn't yes. take any time off. <laughs> And so, I, I was gonna, you got to strike when the what's the I forget the metaphor now, but strike hot. strike while the iron's hot. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> that sounds good. So, it, is it something you still enjoy, or, or is it? Does it just feel like a um, you know obligatory companion piece, or is it? Do you really kind of still get that enjoyment of, of writing? Yeah, you know, I was just thinking last night as I was putting out my show how amazing it is that I still love doing this. I mean, I. 
love my show that I did yesterday. I'm so happy with it. And I think that's that I'm pretty lucky to be able to to do something that I that I enjoy so much still. So let's talk about some of your partners because uh, oh, back over on the network side again because Quick and Dirty Tips has I was trying to count here and now I'm going through my uh, Pocket Cast app my app of choice and I'm <laughs> counting 14 shows but I believe 13 are active am I right or am I under or over where are we at you know I think there are a few more than that I think ah. there might be 15 now 15 or 16 I'm gonna have to talk to Russell from Pocket Casts <laughs> <laughs> wonder why they're not all pulling up. And I thought I knew about all of them, Mignon, and I was going through and I looked at them and I found one that I, for some reason, had never heard of. And I was like, ooh, I want to subscribe to that one. And then I realized it's not active now. The dog uh, trainer. Oh, yeah. You know, we, um, we've we thought about relaunching that. The the oh. host, um, I think she had to quit for personal reasons. And that show was always really great. And then we just haven't gotten around to to replacing her. <laughs> well, I, don't know sure. if we, I don't know if we will. I think that... Um, I, gosh, I, it seems like I've heard that um, my partner Macmillan that they have some host, some authors who do um, books about dogs, and maybe maybe they're talking to them. I'm not quite sure. I also imagine it's probably very evergreen material in that show. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah. Yes. So let's talk about the growth. You said you started with a few friends, and you started with uh, what was sort of uh, – I, I know you mentioned the, the um, Modern Manners guy was the first one after, but kind of take us through the timeline there. Like sort of what was the reception to that show, and then what was the next one out? Kind of how were these early days of Quick and Dirty? Right. So uh, Modern Manners guy was – actually, it was originally Mr. Manners um, – and then we had some legal problems with that. <laughs> but um, then I think Money Girl was next. And um, we, ha- we had a show about se- – remember Second Life, that um, uh, yeah, sort of game, game yeah. universe? We had a show about Second Life called The Traveling Avatar. And um, it always had trouble because the name didn't make sense. People thought it was a, sh- a travel show. <laughs> right, right. So that showed us the importance of having a clear name, actually. Yeah. Um, and so that show got canceled pretty – pretty early on it didn't it just didn't do quite as well um then we had legal lad who was a friend of mr manners and that show was great i loved that show it's just hard to keep um you know lawyers are are busy and they make a lot of money so it's hard to keep lawyers um putting out a weekly podcast (laughs) we went through a a host or two on that and eventually decided um it just wasn't super sustainable um but i loved that show legal lad and then um gosh what was oh the mighty mommy was a wonderful show um start cj fire Robbind, who um is a really good friend of mine was the um the original mighty mommy and did that for many years so with these early shows what was your involvement were you helping with editing helping with topics or were they each of these hosts you mentioned kind of sort of uh fully responsible end to end for these yeah, no, in the beginning, I edited every script, and I did all the audio production, oh, and I made the website, and I posted them all to the website every week. It was an enormous job, and that's that's why I was looking for a partner. <laughs> I knew I couldn't keep doing it all. So take us through that, those those uh, those horrible days towards the end when, when you were probably sleeping three hours a night, uh, trying to, to get all these shows off the ground. What was that decision-making process like, and, and were you wary, or was it just so necessary there was no wariness? Mm. I'm always wary about bringing on a partner, but, um, but I, I mean, I just knew I had no choice. I mean, there was no way I could keep doing it myself. I either, I either would have had to raise venture money or find a partner. And I wasn't, you know, given my, my time in Silicon Valley, I wasn't super enthusiastic about raising venture money. So I, I, and you know, I wanted a partner who could add something too. And so, um, and I was really lucky because when I was thinking about this, it, it all, kind of fell into my lap because the wall street journal picked grammar girl as their web pick of the week. And then I was approached by, I think five different New York publishers who, um, they, they wanted to do a book deal. They wanted me to write a book, but it turned out, um, Macmillan had a digital initiative. They wanted to get into more digital businesses. They could see that's the future of their industry. You know, and I had a vision for how Grammar Girl could be so much more than books. And, you know, John Sterling, who was, I think, the publisher at the time, and I, we just really hit it off and started talking about how it could work. And it's really, it just made so much sense to partner. And then at that point, was this just 
exhale. It was like more where you could start to focus on its expansion now, now that you had sort of this assistance. Well, I think the actually the biggest thing is I also did sign a three book deal as part of that partnership and the advances for the books let me quit my other work freelancing so that freed up an enormous amount of my time so that I could just focus on the network so the first couple years I still did a lot of that same work I was still editing all the transcripts and managing all the hosts as we grew I, I think we brought on audio producers at that point and Macmillan um, quick and dirty tips took on managing the website developing the website. Um, so that freed up some time, but I was still doing all the day-to-day management. And then, um, a couple years after that, it became clear that I couldn't do all that work even. And then, um, we expanded the partnership and, um, Macmillan slash quick and dirty tips took over, um, the day-to-day operations of everything except pretty much, pretty much now I just do grammar girl and, sort of strategic consulting for the whole network, but I don't do any of the day-to-day for the the rest of the network. And so obviously at this juncture in time and, and, and looking back, this was the perfect move for, for you and the network and its ultimate growth. Um, early on, were there any growing pains? Were there any kind of like this negotiation of back and forth of who would be responsible for what? Sort of what is that process going from a wholly you know, uh, dependent subsidiary or, or an individual into sort of a, a component of a larger machine. Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, they're great, but it's always hard to merge essentially two cultures, even though I'm just one person. Um, you know, they were a little slower to take over things than, than I thought they would be. And, you know, web development is always harder than you think it's going to be. But I think, you know, it's it sounds it probably sounds silly, but the, the biggest thing was that they're a corporation, so their people don't work weekends. And <laughs> and I do, you know. Right, so, right. You know, I, I, so I'm emailing them at 10 o'clock at night, and, they're you know, they don't answer till the next morning, and I seem crazy, and they seem like they're not working hard enough. And <laughs> I mean, that was, I would say, the biggest stress point. But, you know, I mean, I think, you know, they didn't do anything wrong, and I didn't do anything wrong. It just, it was just something we had to work out. I, I want to pivot a little bit from the, the network growth part of the story, because also during this time, and this is on the uh, Quick and Dirty Tips uh, Grammar Girl page as well, I'm looking here. You have, uh, and, and each and every one of these I think is so deserved, but you have had a rich history of uh, award winning, if you will, uh, during this time frame that we're sort of talking about here when, when McMillan comes on and the, and the growth really starts to explode. I'm just curious, sort of like the Oprah question, what were you feeling during those days as, as these started to come in? This had to be humbling, I would imagine. It's the best feeling ever. And, you know, I, I'm sure yeah, you were at Podcast Movement and yes. maybe maybe people feel like, oh, she's won all these other awards. But when, when they announced this year that I won Best Education Podcast, my knees were weak. Like I was shaking. <laughs> I was so excited. It just it really it means so much to me every time. And and some of these, it's it's beyond the podcast. I see awards here for writing for the blog for the website, right? Um, right. And, I, what, go ahead. No, go ahead. One of the things I'm really proud of is that um, Writers Digest magazine has chosen the website as one of the 101 best websites for writers. You know, for many years running, and you know that that's a to me that's a very prestigious award, and and I'm I'm really proud of that. Yeah, so so you mentioned we touched on it a little earlier. I think I got a little ahead of ourselves in terms of the chronology, which I try to go in order, but sometimes I mess up. That's okay. Uh, talk about that education component because now it is sort of that it's got to be sort of this uh, companion piece. Very often, you must hear from schools or professors or or, or college students that that they've gone to uh, an archived episode or the website or what have you. And do you feel as if you've really kind of now created? between the website and the podcast and the book, this this huge treasure trove of resource for these folks. Yeah, now, because there are, there I think there are, um, I've done more than 500 podcast episodes, but the recent ones have had three segments. So I think there are about seven or 800 Grammar Girl articles on the website, you know, and then there's, there are the seven books. And, and yes, I mean, I hear all the time from teachers, everything from, 
middle school to college who use the books in class. In fact, one of my the professors in my department at um, University of Nevada used my book with his um, introductory writing class last year. So, you know, it's, 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 and, and, oh my gosh, it's amazing. You know, I've been doing this so long. I occasionally hear from people who say, I used your books in high school. And now that I'm a teacher myself, I'm using them again. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty amazing. <laughs> okay. So if, if I'd have been you, here's what I would have done. The professor in my department who uses it for the intro to writing class, I would have just wanted to know the day and I'd have uh-huh. just walked in. <laughs> just, because nobody would have believed it was you that type of thing you know be like so what are you guys reading there uh yeah, but that's just me. <laughs> right i think he told them if they had questions they could go to my office hours yeah. but nobody <laughs> ever came <laughs> you go down the hall if you got any questions yeah <laughs> well that's 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 amazing that's uh it, again i i just have to ask you you never really expected that did you when you first launched no no i never expected that <laughs> 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 I mean, I, it, it's just amazing. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, like I said, I, I thought maybe this could be a business because that's how I think of everything. But, you know, to think that it's still really hard to believe even, you know, I mean, I, 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 for the 500 episode anniversary, I asked people to let me know where they listen, to tell me stories about where they listen or how they listen. And I heard from people all over the world, you know, I mean, I heard from someone from, Dubai and (laughs) United Arab Emirates and, you know, Russia. I mean, it's just, and and I, I, you know, it it blows me away every time. Like I know I see the stats and I know there are people listening all over the world, but it still just doesn't really register. But when I, when I hear from people, I'm still amazed. Do you think a lot of those listeners are sort of ESL type students trying to get better? I do. Yeah, I th- I do think that makes up a a portion of the audience now and they really like that the transcripts almost word for word are on the site so they can follow along and so right. that they can listen and read. Um it's you know, it's, I'm not sure the percent of the audience that it is, maybe I don't know, maybe 20-25%. So you mentioned you mentioned how many episodes in. I just double checked here. 529 as as of the moment of this conversation, but there's probably uh one or two more uh folks as you are listening right now. I got to know, with that many episodes, do you ever have difficulty finding a particular topic? I know people send some things in, questions and what have you, but but have you ever had difficulty in finding a topic? Kind of. I mean, I, I do um, not really reruns now, but I'll revisit old topics because, you know, if I did how to use a semicolon eight years ago, most people probably haven't heard it, or even if they did, they forgot. Right. So, and especially if there's a news hook, then I'll re um, revisit an old topic. Um, so I've been doing that quite a bit lately. Although, there, I mean, and because there are segments, there's always at least one new um, topic every show. But often now there's a, an older revision in there too. But, you know, I'm still amazed. People send me questions and I'll think that I answered that and I'll be surprised <laughs> that it's not on my site. Really? I never covered that? <laughs> you know, maybe I answered a question on Facebook or something but didn't do it in the show. Yeah, there's got to be there's obviously so much to talk about with the English language. It just uh amazes me that you're you still have uh, you know, things that that are not yet discussed. You mentioned uh cultural references and and, and folks, I'll put another link in the show notes. You did a TEDx talk about a year and a half ago uh yeah. that I I saw here recently it was super cool and you got into things like adulting and 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 what have you. So, I I think it's great to have your take on sort of those more cultural components and um and i like how you are not one of the ones that will sort of you know rail against its uh you know people using it no i mean language change is fascinating it is what makes thinking about language fun um yeah adulting is a word it just i love that word it's caught my eye and um one of my friend's daughter my friend's daughter used it and and I, inst- I, I had, she told me what it meant. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I noticed it and I searched Twitter and I see it everywhere. And I actually, I have this, I, I don't even know what to do with it. I have a spreadsheet. I pulled down tweets. I have like 10,000 tweets that have the word adulting in them in a spreadsheet. <laughs> I was going to like make a map or categorize them, you know, as positive and negative comment. I just had all these ideas about what to do with it, but it was too, it was actually overwhelming. I got, had so many. <laughs> it's it, a great- you know, I think it's just so fun how new words arise and language changes. It just fascinates me. 
I think it's a great TEDx talk. I really enjoyed that. And, and, and again, <laughs> folks, there'll be a link in that for the, the show notes as well. It, 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 was, uh, it was really neat uh, to see you in that to see you in that uh, sort of different environment, right, in terms of in front of a live audience talking more sort of about language as opposed to just a, a particular topic. So it was a neat little kind of change of pace off a, a normal Grammar Girl episode. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I had to memorize that, which I don't do with my show. So no teleprompter? There was no teleprompter? No teleprompter. I had to wow. memorize that whole talk. <laughs> Very nice. Very yeah. nice. So uh, one thing I like to ask all the time, and, you know, is to sort of nowadays, take me through your average day, right? How does an episode of Grammar Girl or, or sort of the day-to-day of Quick and Dirty kind of get put together? What do your days look like? Sure. Well, every day is a little different, but uh, putting together the show, I, I work with a lot of guest writers now too, which really it helps me, you know, manage my schedule. But also, I love that they have their own ideas about topics. So that's another way I get new ideas. Is guest writers will come up with ideas that that I didn't think of. So that's wonderful. So, you know, I probably will get a script from someone and, and review it, edit it, you know, s- send them questions if I have them. If I don't, you know, I mean, I have some guest writers who, you know, I pretty much can just use their scripts straight as they send send them to me and others that need a little more work. So, you know, depending on who it's from, I'll do a lot of editing or not. And then, um, you know, I check my email and there's always some questions or interaction with the people at Quick and Dirty Tips about what's going on with the whole network and the website and things like that. New things we're thinking about trying and, you know, just the back, general back and forth. Um, and then I check Twitter and Facebook and try to answer questions that people have posted for me there and uh, just keep up with what other people who post about language are are writing about or sharing because they think it's interesting. That's another place. Sometimes I get ideas or just keep just read interesting things. Um, and then, you know, to do the show, I think people would probably be surprised how long it takes to do the show because it's so short. It's maybe 12 minutes, 15 minutes in the end, but, you know, I'll probably record for 30 minutes and then I'll edit it for an hour. Um, you know, I make all the web pages that go with, the segments that probably takes another hour, an hour and a half. Make the images that go with the web pages. Um, put in all the links. Put in all the metadata and formatting, and make the thumbnail for the version that's going to go on YouTube. And you know, there's just a lot of little administrative stuff that um, goes into putting out the show. So the production, you know, it's funny because I got into Grammar Girl to keep the production simple, but <laughs> it's not so simple still. <laughs> and it seems to be getting harder, right? Like we all get faster at things, but then there's all these other sort of social channels and distribution channels and all these other ways to kind of connect with an audience. It's just more work. <laughs> right. It does. And um, I, ha- I have a part-time assistant who's worked with me for many years. And so if I get my show done early enough in the week, she will uh, make the web pages and the images for me. But I almost never get them done in time for her to help me <laughs> well I for, I for one would buy how long uh you know that 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 takes to put together from talking with all the hosts and producers that I've talked to nobody ever really fully knows all that goes into it and that's one of the reasons I wanted to start the show is to kind of let people know all that's really involved with what you ultimately see delivered into your podcast queue is so I... much more behind those scenes that's for sure yeah and for I had this horrible run for the last, I think it's been two months of shows now. Every show I've mispronounced something, said a wrong word, or accidentally bumped the microphone and not realized it and had to go back in and re-record a segment after I was done. Oh, no. Really frustrating. I really want to break that streak. <laughs> <laughs> this is the week. <laughs> this, yeah, this is the week. The week. Right here. Uh, I got a, just a few more questions for you, Mignon. I want to kind of I'm jumping around here now because I've still got my iPad in front of me, scrolling through all the awesome shows, uh, even if I think I'm missing one. Uh, <laughs> for quick and dirty, uh, if you had, and, and this isn't about. I want to be sure I'm not asking you to pick a favorite, but uh, looking at, you know, either maybe because of the age of the show or maybe numbers or whatever, what is sort of like the dark horse favorite of yours, if you will, that that you would really like people to kind of check out uh, because it's it's doing so awesome? Oh, my gosh. That is so hard. (laughs) It's like picking a favorite child, right? I know. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, they're all good shows, and it really depends on what you're interested in. I mean, Nutrition Diva is really popular for people who are into into food and get fit guys. You know, people who are into fitness love him. Um, who knew is our really inter- new a new show that's 
like really super household tip based and cool. That's the one um, missing. That's the one missing from Pocket Casts. Yeah, that's it's it's one it's one of the newest ones. Who that, knew? And cool. um, oh, the History Show. Who's, oh, they're gonna be so mad at me. I can't remember the name, <laughs> but we have this wonderful new History Show on the Quick and Dirty <laughs> Tips Network. Um, that that's is also. Nice. You really have to go great. in and change its name to Wonderful I, New History Show. <laughs> I, unknown History. Unknown hey. History. So, um, but I, I guess, you know, I kind of have a, a soft spot in my heart for uh, the Get It Done guy, our productivity show, because yes. he was the first um, podcaster that we added after we formed the partnership that formed uh, the Quick and Dirty Tips partnership with McMillan. And we really weren't ready to we felt like we weren't ready to add a show and because he's the get it done guy <laughs> he hounded us <laughs> he like made us hire him he made us bring on his show because he just wouldn't give up <laughs> so you know steve robbins is the host of that show and and i'll always have a a soft spot in my heart for him he hunted me down at a conference and like made me sit and listen to his show <laughs> and, and then just kept emailing he was so persistent which is exactly what the get it done guy should be <laughs> and, and i'll throw my personal endorsement behind that one as well because that's another one i've been listening to for a very long time and and stever's so cool like he's got so many it's sort of like grammar girl in the sense of it's it's that short format right it's the shorter mm-hmm. length and what have you but i think he does so much with that short length uh, he's almost artistic in the way he's got characters he's got running themes he's got recurring sort of elements week to week to week and it's uh it's really well done and i think he does a phenomenal job so i, I will throw my recommendation as well behind uh, that that show yeah thank you and steve's fabulous and the show is great <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is it is uh, it is a neat thing that's for sure and, and tech talker i've also listened to for a good long while as well cuz i am a very uh, tech-focused aficionado as well. So, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's several ones. Yeah, that's a great show. And, and that's a great show, too, for the tip, you know, the tip-based format. Tech Talker is great for that. Absolutely. There's so many good things. And I'll tell you what, I, I, I want to ask with just one more question, which is uh, the, the, the Hall of Fame induction for the Academy of Podcasters. So you mentioned receiving the award for Grammar Girl that right. night, but then you also had this induction into Hall of Fame. And up there with a lot of other big names, as well as previous year inductees. Has this kind of hit you now that you are sort of one of uh, the godmothers, if you will, of <laughs> podcasting at this point, that, 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 that a lot of people in this business, my, myself included, really kind of look at you and what you've accomplished and, and really sort of take cues from, from your experience and in, in, in your catalog of achievement, because it, it, is, it is one you should feel extraordinarily proud of. Thank you. Yeah, that meant so much. To, I mean, that meant more to me than, you know, going on the Oprah Winfrey show or, or the other things. I mean, I joke like that's going in my obituary. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a lifetime achievement. That's a big deal. So it really it means it just it meant so much to me to be included in the in the Hall of Fame with all the other amazing people who are in there. You know, it was um, that's really special. <laughs> did you did you did you worry about writing the speech? I did, yes, and I, and I worry. Yeah, I worried about everything. I'm a worrier, but <laughs> you know, I worried about what to wear and what to say, and yeah, it was yeah, just a big ball of worry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, your speech was phenomenal. Your show's always been great, but but it was your speech that night that made me want to seek you out because I you exuded a an approachability um, that that. I hadn't hadn't become clear to me yet, if you will, through listening to the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, because maybe it's just the focus was different, right? Because at that speech that night, it's more like you're reflecting on that person, their achievements, and how they've got this far, and what they've all sort of brought to the table. And and I thought your speech was wonderful, and I was I was very very happy as somebody who's. I think I probably started listening to Grammar Girl in 08, 09, somewhere in that window, right around the time I started to get into podcast listening. Uh, and then to, uh, to, to see you honored that way, I, I know a lot of people were very, very happy for you. Thank you. Well, I think the, the most important thing for me to get out in that speech is, you know, everyone sees me, but it's a team effort. Like, uh, there's so many people who've helped me over the years and who work behind the scenes to make this show get out every week. The guest writers, the producers, the business people at Quick and Dirty Tips. I mean, that was what was really important to me is for, to help people understand that even though I'm the visible one, there are so many other people involved that help make it happen every week. Yeah, I think the interesting side to that, what I was thinking that whole time when you were talking about that was, wow, I wonder what all these people would be doing if you hadn't started this all. 
you know, yeah. sort of like the, all these people are doing what they're doing now because you drove through those first few months, though that that crazy, you know, freelancing full time and starting this up, and and now to see this all realized, it was it was your drive and ambition from the beginning that had all these people now doing what able to do the great work that they're doing now to help Quick and Dirty Tips as a whole. So, and that's what's super rewarding about entrepreneurship is knowing that you've created jobs or work for other people like that feels really good yeah it's uh, folks i cannot tell you enough if you've not heard grammar girl again where what's the zip code of the rock you're living under because i don't know where it is it's uh it's ridiculous if you haven't heard it but we've talked about a few there's so many other great things on quick and dirty tips and i want you to check them all out uh, at least scroll through the titles and, and figure out which sort of topic uh speaks to you and check it out so uh mignon tell folks where they can find all this stuff we've been talking about i'm going to include a bunch of links in the show notes to the to the books and the tedx talk and what have you but let them know now if they don't want to scroll over <laughs> thank you yeah if you go to quick and dirty dirtytips.com. Every show in the network is there. You can find all the hosts, all the transcripts. And if you click on the um, host name, it'll take you to the page where you can find how to subscribe to the podcast. And then, you know, if you just go to Google and search Grammar Girl, you'll, you'll get my Twitter and Facebook and links to my books and you search for the TED Talk. And it's, <laughs> it's you know, pretty much just search for Grammar Girl and you can find almost anything you want about me. <laughs> yeah, and that's true because I've done that recently and I found a whole bunch. So. <laughs> All right. There's even a little recording of how to pronounce my name. <laughs> there you go. And I will make sure, folks, though, that the most pertinent of those links I will include directly in the show notes, as I always do. So, Mignon, thank you very much for taking the time to join me. I really enjoyed this. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me, Dan. It's been fun. And, folks, that'll do it for Episode 105 of the Podcast Digest until 106, which will be another great conversation with a show you must uh, check out and go behind the scenes of with me. My name's Dan Lizette. Talk to you then. Thank you for listening to the Podcast Digest. You can follow the show on Twitter at PodDigest. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Podcast Digest. Email the show feedback at the Podcast Digest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info. Digest.info.